Let's find out. I'm joined by Independent Senator Nick Xenophon, Liberal Te Democratic Senator David Lionhelm and Independent Senator Jackie Lambie. Thank you all for coming along. Thank you. Nick Xenophon, I'll start with you. What do you like and dislike about this budget? Well, I think the government has retreated from some of their harsher measures. Um, I like the small business concessions. I think that will be good in terms of uh, jobs growth. I think it will small business is an engine driver of economic growth. Um, I am very deeply concerned that the sum, there's no commitment yet to build the submarines here in Australia. That's a huge issue in my home state of South Australia with national implications for shipbuilding, particularly in Victoria and New South Wales. And I don't quite understand why the government is prepared to spend $5 billion to develop Northern Australia, Northern Infrastructure Fund which I don't have an issue with as much uh, as such, but it seems that the southern states, particularly uh, Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania, may well be left behind with looming job losses in the auto sector. So they are real concerns of mine. David Lionhelm, Liberal Democrat, I'm assuming you think the government's spending way too much money. Indeed, they're taxing too much as well. This, this is, um, well, we're a low tax, um, low spending party. Um, we just don't think the government needs to do anywhere near as much as it does do. And, and uh, overall, I suppose you could say, well, the least you could do is not load future generations of younger people with debt that has to be paid off, especially when it's not being used to build infrastructure, bridges and roads and airports and things like that. But that's what's going on at the moment. We're really not going to get back into uh, surplus anywhere near quick enough. They're forecasting 2019-20 um, before the budget returns to surplus, and even that is quite unbelievable. Mm. There's way too many assumptions involved in that, and they're just not achievable. Jackie Lambie? Um, look, I love the small business measures. However, he's going to spoil it if he doesn't leave the family tax B in, because a lot of that family tax B, um, it's for lower income families, and they spend it in their local communities in small business. So I think that uh, unless he leaves that family tax B in there, uh, there's going to be a problem with that. I didn't say anything on higher education. Uh, so that uh, I found that quite daunting. I think it's very important that we educate our kids for the future. And, um, you know, I think that there's still missed opportunities that we could have saved money. We've got $750 million that we're obviously spending in the Middle East on our ADF. I think we've made my feelings quite clear in that. They need to be home. They need to be home on home soil. We've still got the $5 billion sitting there in asset sales or bribe to the states. Um, they're not taking that up. I think we withdraw that money. We cannot afford to sell off or lease off any more of our assets. And then, of course, um, the foreign aid budget, they may have cut it down a little bit, but I'll tell you what, when I first come out, I said I want a 50% cut out of that foreign aid budget and I want it spent in our own backyard. 40% has just come out of Indonesia. Do you think that's punishment for what we just saw in Indonesia, Nick Xenophon? Uh, I think it was always on the cards. I have a different view on foreign aid. I think foreign aid uh, builds alliances with, with the region. Uh, those countries that are lifted out of poverty become our future trading partners. Uh, there's an economic benefit for us in the longer term, but also in terms of being good, good citizens in the region, I think foreign aid is important. Can I just see if we can establish a, any kind of baseline for agreement here among three very different people? Do you or do you not believe that the government actually does have to reduce its spending over time or that we might face? If we don't face one now, we may very well face a crisis of financing in the future, Jackie. Oh, absolutely, I do. And you know, there's. And doesn't that mean you need to cut spending? Well, what it means is we need to work out how we're going to make more money. Now, I've simply uh, I've put through a financial transactions tax that could raise anywhere to, to uh, well over ten billion dollars in the forward estimates. Except trying to get the Liberal Party to sit down and talk to me about that. That's the problem. We're still having communication problems, so I think that's that's one of the worst things. So your answer is to raise spending, not cut, not make any cuts. Uh, I don't think raise taxes. I should not, not make any spending cuts. Yeah, I think we raise some taxes, but right now people out there they're doing it tough, and uh, still they're still coming after the low income earner. And like I said, I'm still worried about our higher education. That's just completely been lit been left off the um, table and I'm really concerned about those and areas. And yet, gentlemen, our welfare bill is, bill is 35 per cent of the budget and will grow by 16 per cent over the next and three we, years. Is we, that sustainable? No, it's not. And, and we will be more in debt now than we've been since the, these budget figures started being kept since 1970 with the exception of Keating's last year. Um, so uh, the Howard government inherited a si significant debt, paid it off with Costello as the Treasurer. Um, we're, we're now back to that situation. We're just as bad as we are there now. And what we don't have now is a, the equivalent of a Costello to pay it back. So we have got a, a growing significant debt problem. And, um, 
I, dis I disagree with Jackie in that I don't think it's a revenue problem, it's a spending problem. But the, can I also point out that we won't return to surplus um, uh, unless the government allows bracket creep to, to creep up the tax revenue. The, I've read the budget papers. The only way we will return to surplus under the scenario that it, is in the budget papers is by leaving the income tax alone. Well, can I just say, one thing I think we, we probably do agree on is that the assumptions made in the budget about a return to surplus are, to paraphrase the Yes Minister, courageous ones. Uh, there's no way that we'll get there. They're, they are rubbery figures. Um, I think and, we'd agree on that. Yes, yes. right. And, and without being cruel, cruel to Joe Hockey, this is an improvement on last year's budget from my point of view, but it's still a case of close but no cigar. Uh, it really is a case where this, this budget uh, doesn't tackle some of the fundamental issues. There is an existential crisis in the West ageing populations, uh, reduced revenue, we need to be smarter, we need to reinvent government, how do you deliver more with less in a sense, but also the iron ore prices. Uh, last week I spoke to Andrew Forrest, I think he's got something, uh, something in it in what he said about uh, whether the iron ore price has been forced down as a result uh, of, uh, of market behaviour. That's why I'm pushing for a Senate inquiry on that whole issue. Okay, so surely the government's going to come to you and ask you about the package that you've just seen mm. tonight. There are really just two elements of it. One mm. is a, a business package a jobs package. Mm. The other one is the childcare package. But Jackie Lambie, to get that childcare package through, they'll say, well, you've got to give us some money, and that money comes by way of cutting family tax benefit part B. Yeah, no, that's rubbish. And um, it's like, um, I, I just think that that's absolute rubbish. But I just wanted to pick up a point, what you said about Howard there. The reason that they were able to bring um, the surplus back to a surplus when Howard was in was because he sold nearly $50 billion worth of Australian assets. We've got hardly anything left to sell. So I don't think that's, Australian that's the way. Australian Railway Corporation, whoopee. Yeah, so... That's four billion dollars. Um, mm. no. well, you know, I suppose a billion here, a billion there, pretty sorry. soon you're talking about real money. I think, what, <laughs> I, yeah, I think what we have here is a Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde budget, I'm calling it, because I'm not sure... Um, I'm not sure which one of them I'm supposed to deal with. I mean, here last, last, only 10 months ago, they were saying we're in a budget emergency, businesses nearly had to close their doors, phones stopped ringing. I mean, they put it in a budget emergency themselves with the way they did things last year. So they've gone from being really hardcore to nearly Kleenex material. Pulling your belt to borrow and spend, it's yes. what the Treasurer is saying. But I just want to get a view from you too on the childcare package. Mm -hmm. Are you are you prepared to negotiate with Joe Hockey on where he gets the money, or Scott Morrison in this instance, to fund that childcare package? Well, I, I supported the family tax benefit um, wind back that they, that they brought to the Senate last time, and I would again. I think, I think it's legitimate that when um, kids reach six, um, they go to school. Um, we don't have to start handing over money to them just because they, they've got kids. So I'm happy to... Um, uh, to wind back family tax benefits. Um, the childcare, my argument is no more money needs to be spent on childcare so long as it is excessively regulated. The National Equality Framework imposed massive new costs on childcare. Um, you have to have a, de a degree or a diploma or a, or a certificate in, in childcare to work in those places. Everybody who gets those qualifications naturally wants higher pay. Do you have some level of regulation, surely? Some, some level of regulation is fine. We've gone way past what's, what's some. Um, what, you don't really need the level of regulation we've got. And if they wound that back, the cost of childcare would fall and there would be no need for additional subsidies. Senator Zenderholm? Well, I don't think the government's going to wind back the national quality framework. I think there is some excessive red tape in childcare, but you do need a benchmarked uh, quality framework. But in terms, uh, in terms of what uh, is being proposed, increasing the level of participation, particularly of women in the workforce, is good for the economy. But the fundamental uh, flaw or potential flaw in that assumption is that there are jobs to go to. The job market is getting weaker. Uh, the level of underemployment is very significant. In my home state of South Australia, the job figures are getting worse, not better. Uh, they will get much worse, particularly in the southern states, with the demise of the auto manufacturing sector and the flow-on effects of tens of thousands of jobs, unless there is action to ensure that there are alternative jobs to, for people to go through. So I, I think the assumptions are, are, are just a bit rubbery, particularly on a 5% unemployment figure. Sure. Can I just add, though, that the productivity... I'm, I'm sympathetic to Nick's idea, so we're looking for common ground here. but. I'm somewhat sympathetic to the idea of getting uh, low-income uh, um, people back into the workforce, women with children, um, and if childcare is going to do it, I am, you know, in principle, have some sympathy for that idea. But the Productivity Commission said there's very few people that would actually return in reality 
w uh, return to the workforce. They so said 16,000. 16, the government's got a whole lot more than that. You want to see some more figuring on that, don't you? I, we need to see the modelling. And, 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 you know, as far, as far as common ground goes, I think we all pretty much agree that the figures are pretty rubbery. We need to see the modelling. Look, I think, and I don't know what my, uh, my colleagues think, I think the government is leaving their options open to have an election by the end of this year. This, this budget has enough sweeteners in it uh, to, to allow them to go to the polls if they need to. Well, we'll know they're serious about that if they change the electoral laws mm. to make it more difficult for people well, like you to be elected. Yeah, and I think people need to understand that. The proof of a hung Senate is, um, you know, it's about consultation and, and we haven't caused chaos. We've actually been able to save, we've protected pensioners and students. Um, you know, we've, we've done um, families and the unemployed from an unfair Liberal cuts which would have put the country in chaos by now had those cuts been taken last year. So I, I guess that's their, their whole flip because they've done a whole backflip on this. Like I said, they, went, they come out really hard, they've softened their approach right up but I think they still haven't got it right. And, and with childcare, I'm a big believer when it comes to kids, the early children um, are associating with other children and they're, they're in school and um, that is built in built with them and mothers can go out and either go back to school or go back um, okay. to find jobs, then I think we should encourage that and we shouldn't, you know, you should never put a price on that. Just, well, to, just to follow up on yes. your point, Chris, about uh, an early election and changing the electoral laws, the, the strong rumour circulating is that Labor won't cooperate with that, so it will have to be a deal between the government and the Greens. That's, that's the story that's currently circulating. So that will be very interesting politically in many, many ways. We'll prosecute and find it out. David Lionhelm, Nick Xenophon, Jackie Lambie, thank you very much for being Thanks on for this evening. Thank you. Well, we'll have more